Um, you were explaining that uh, about the art, you know, like you, you were mentioning how it is a very inner meaning when to offer the incense. How is like uh, when to the deep and the other? Um, yes. This is not anything fixed because Shastra uh -huh. doesn't say anything. So it's natural. In, in Vaidhi Bhakti, a person follows the rules and regulations. So generally, they, they may think that if you offer incense, this represents earth, because fragrance yeah. is the quality of earth. And then so if you offer deep, then this is offering fire. And if you offer a fan, then this is air. So they have some Aishwarya, sometimes Aishwarya conceptions like this. But in Raghunuga Bhakti, there's no fixed conception, otherwise it would not be Raghunuga Bhakti. Mm -hmm. so then it will be Vaidhi Bhakti again. You have, now you have to think like this, now you have to think like this. Raghunuga Bhakti is uh, spontaneous. So it looks the same. Outwardly it looks the same, but inwardly it's according to the, the taste and realization of that particular devotee on that day. Yeah. Everyone wants to know, how, how do I do Raghunuga Bhakti? You cannot. How do Please show me how to be spontaneous. <laughs> <laughs> what are the three steps to become to be spontaneous? <laughs> you cannot. This is not a question. <laughs> <laughs> but w when we listen yeah. with the, from our guru, death, he's a, a spontaneous mood. Then Sunday. because it depends on the arti. If the arti is Mangal arti, then in in the Raghunuga Bhakti, the devotee thinks of the Nishanta Lila, Radha Krishna waking up. So then it's a bit uh, not very light in the kunj because only the first morning light of the sun is coming. So if the devotee is offering the deep, then they'll think, oh, some maid summons of Radha Krishna are looking with the deep in the dark to see if there are any evidence of Radha Krishna's meeting on their bodies. And then they're giving water to wash it and then a cloth to wipe it away like this. So when they go home, no one will suspect that they were meeting in the night time. I guess so, mm, but obviously if you think, oh, this is what you have to meditate on arti, then in noon arti, or in the evening arti, then it's not applicable <coughs> because that's applicable only to that time of the day. <coughs> also, anyway, the, mm, the Sakis of Radhika, like Lalita, they offer arti to Radha Krishna, not thinking about any meanings. Why? Because arti means that uh, to uh, drive away all inauspiciousness. So for example, if a Krishna is coming back from uh, tending the cows in the day, some demons have attacked or anything, so Madhya Shodhu will come and offer arti to Krishna to remove any auspiciousness that may, uh, he may have come in contact with during the day. When Radha Krishna meet in the Kunj, then, so that Chandravali will not try to destroy anything, that uh, Jutila will not come, or Kutila, or Abhima, or anything, Lalita is offering Arti to Radha and Krishna, to remove any inauspiciousness. Also, the mood of the Arti can be that um, whatever you see, success, happiness comes from your piety. So whatever piety, whatever happiness I have, uh, this I am offering to you so that you can be happy. So Madhya Shodhu will do... Madhya Shodhu is not worshipping Krishna that you are Bhagavan or anything like that. It's to remove inauspiciousness and offer all her piety that you will have a happy and long and successful life. So then the actual articles, they don't have a meaning in that sense. It's just that the art itself is, a, is an expression of care, an expression of protection, an expression of... Um, Wishing the very best for that person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yes. What about the Gornik In the Arctic or Gornik for example? Well, that is, the, the Sandhya, the Sandhya Arti. So when you worship Mahaprabhu alone, or whether you worship Gornitai, you should always think Mahaprabhu is with the Panchadatta, Sivastakur, Gorada Pandit, and all their associates. Because always worship is going on in, in the Yoga Pit. So Yoga Pit means Supreme Lord is there, surrounded by his associates in one layer, two layers, three layers, seven layers, seven avarants. Because the, uh, so the art is always related to a yoga pit. So when you worship Mahaprabhu, 
especially in the evening. It's the Sangha Arctic on the bank of the Janari in, in my home. And Mahaprabhu, he's golden. And his golden effulgence is spreading out. But this golden effulgence is Radharani's effulgence. And that's why when a person has the vision of that and is touched by that golden effulgence, then because Radharani's mood is, is Mahabhar, and the spreading out of her effulgence is called Yavadashtrai Vritti. That means her own mood is spreading out. So by worshipping Mahaprabhu, having Darshan seeing his mood, and being touched by his effulgence during the Arti, that means that one is being uh, becoming pervaded with Radharani's mood. So that's why it says that Mahaprabhu is distributing the Mandri uh, mood of the maidservants. How? Uh, he's not doing anything. Only his effulgence is doing that. That's why Rupa Swami said, Hari Kurata Sundara Juti Kadamba Sandi Jitaha. Samara Paito Munnata Ujwala Sam Sopakti Siyam. Mahaprabhu is completely giving the uh, service to Radhika. How? Hari Kurata Sundara Juti. Just by his golden effulgence. So Sadhari Riyakanda Reis Pratuba Sachinandana. May that golden Sachinandan appear in the cave of your heart. And just by that, his effulgence will give you everything. Guru, frame, rays of frame are emanating. So when we worship our Guru, then by service to Guru, slowly we begin to realize that Guru's form is transcendental. Not only that form there, this form here also. We see the light emanating from Guru's lotus feet. And being touched by that, we become overwhelmed with the, with the same sentiments. We, we yeah, imbibe and become permeated by Gurudev's sentiment. So worship is always... Uh, the uh, the purpose of bowing down, of offering worship, is the transference of the Swarup Shakti, the transference of the Bhakti Shakti. This is asking very complicated questions, I'm sorry. No, 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 I like it. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice. But if you have any basic questions, yes, maybe it's a silly thing. But you about what you said yesterday that uh, how we have to behave when we get the uh, diksha, mm. how we have to behave before. Diksha. Actually, uh, diksha is a process, and it begins as soon as you start to surrender. When someone came to my Gurudev and asked him, when does Diksha really begin? Gurudev said, for some people, even though they received initiation, but Diksha did not begin. And for other people, they have not received initiation, but Diksha has already begun. Because it depends on the Shanagati, it depends on the spirit of surrender. If you receive initiation, you do a very independent, you keep independent life, independent activities, independent ideas, then even though a person may have a Brahmin thread and a spiritual name and everything, Diksha hasn't started. And if a person, even they have not received the first initiation to receive the Mahamantra, but they're fixing their mind, how can I please my spiritual master? And they're endeavoring to have their own mind and own get all perfection in bhakti just by listening to Hare Krishna. You can get all perfection just by chanting in Kirtan without any diction or any However, because the mind is restless and because we have some bad habits, so it becomes very difficult to um, receive the bhakti shakti just by listening or, or just by Kirtan. So this diksha is a formal process which regulates our life to prepare us and to take away the restlessness of the mind and the bad habits. So restlessness of mind is called chitta mm, chitta.
Yeah, it is empty. Okay, just, just relocate it. because it's dusty. Just lock the flock. Like a turnover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, as we were explaining, Srila Jiva Goswami Bhakti Sandar, he said that any one of the angers, the practices of bhakti is powerful enough to give all perfection. However, uh, persons who are afflicted by vikshipta chitta, restless mind, and kadarya shil, kadarya shil means uh, unvirtuous activities or bad habits, they cannot quickly receive the benefit of practicing bhakti. And so, in the Narad Pancharatra, some rules and regulations have been laid out, a process that you follow under the guidance of Guru to overcome Bhikshipta Chitta, restless mind, and Kadarya Shil, um, uh, bad habits or unvirtuous activities. So, uh, when a person receives the Diksha, then they have to rise early in the morning, take shower, make a Tilak, and uh, attend RT. They have to do some puja, worship their deities every day. So for this they have to be clean, they have to be regulated in their life, and they'll move towards Sattva Gun and away from the lower Gunas. They'll have to sit quietly and remember Gayatri Mantras three times a day, and so on, and worship Tulsi, do Parikrama of Tulsi, all of these things. So there are 64 Angas, 64 types of Vaidhi Bhakti. You should follow these. And so because this uh, regulates that devotee's life. Uh, gradually, they become uh, free from Rajagun, Tamagun, they become more sattvic. And as soon as sattva is prominent, the mind becomes stable. Because sattva is not uh, dynamic. Sattva is niskriya, it has no activity. Rajas does all activity. All kriya. Kriya means activity. All kriya is done by Rajagun. So when the mind becomes very sattvic, becomes peaceful and it's not oscillating so much. And then very easily realization comes by the, any anger bhakti hearing, chanting, remembering, and so on. So that's why um, parampara is not necessarily a diksha parampara. Mm -hmm. the, the line of gurus doesn't depend on diksha because bhakti itself doesn't depend on diksha. But we can say that in Kali Yuga, most of the living entities, they have very restless minds and they have very bad habits. <laughs> yes. So as a general rule, everyone, though bhakti doesn't depend on diksha, but everyone should go through that because that's how they'll be successful. So diksha is, uh, it is said there are panch angas, five angas of diksha. The first one is tapa, that is when you get branded with, with a hot iron, the marks of Vishnu on the body. But this tapa, this burning, we don't do that these days, but we have to do the inner meaning of tapa, and that is anutap. Anutap means regret, the burning of regret, that oh, until this time in my life, before I came to my guru, I was wasting my time. I have done many... Um, sinful activities, sense gratification, and being in a state of obliviousness, a state of uh, indifference, not caring about God, only caring about myself. So the first step of initiation is to feel regret. Because unless we feel regret for the way that we lived before, we will not transform. We will not adopt a new way of living. If we think the way I was living before is, oh, it's very wonderful then we have no motivation to change. So the motivation to change comes from the regret or the repentance of our previous life, our previous mood, our previous activities. So the first step in initiation is not visible. It's one's own repentance and regret. Then the next step in initiation is called Urdhva Pundra, giving Tilak. So Urdhva means going up. And the idea is this, that the person who feels regret no longer wants to be involved in the worldly activities and they turn their attention up towards God, towards the spiritual world. So to apply tilak 
It's not just a decoration, it's not the cosmetics mm, to make you look more beautiful. Tilak means my attitude is looking up. Mm, that everything I'm doing, I have no goal in the physical plane. I have no anchor here, holding me here. All of my thoughts and desires, my aspirations, they are beyond this world. So the second part of the initiation diksha is the acceptance of Tilak. So these first two, uh, Tapa and Urdhva Pundra, is looking away from the world and looking up towards God. Then the third part of initiation is Guru gives the Harinam, the Hare Krishna Mahamantra, and it changes your name. Before your name was whatever, Francesco, hmm? or something. So now you, you will get a name which is a name of Krishna, but with the Das at the end. So Govinda Das, Krishna Das, Gopal Das, Jagannath Das, Madhusudan Das, some spiritual name of Krishna. So when you say this name, you purify yourself. When others say it and hear it, they become purified. And Das means servant. So now you are, I am servant of Krishna. That's your name, servant of Krishna. <laughs> so, that is the third part, to receive the Hare Krishna Mahamantra and have a new spiritual name. Third part of Diksha. So when you see it in the traditional sense that Diksha has five limbs, then you know that actually it is not receiving Harinam and then Diksha, really. But rather the process of mm, put, surrender to Guru, putting on Tilak, receiving Harinam, that was already the process of Diksha was going on. Huh? And then the next one is the receiving Mantra. The Gayatri Mantra. So those mantras are never spoken out loud and they establish your relation, what type of relationship you have with Krishna. So everyone is related to Krishna in a particular mood. Some are servants, some serve like friends with more intimacy. Some love Krishna like a parent, like Madhishona, who is caring for him like her child. And some serve Krishna like the gopis of Vrindavan in a romantic mood. So at the, at the time of that fourth Anger. Guru gives us a secret mantra that you never speak out loud. And this mantra nourishes your particular special relationship that you have with Krishna. That you will, when you go to the spiritual world, how you will be serving there, or oh, this will be revealed by that mantra. So, um, Diksha is the fourth, uh, sorry, receiving the Gayatri mantras, Diksha mantras, that's the fourth thing. And then the fifth one is called the Aj, and it means to learn how to do puja. So Gurudev shows you how to uh, prepare the food and give tosi and sprinkle water. And all the mantras, how to offer your food to Krishna, and how to offer arti, how to do archan, all the things related to puja. So then these five things taken together constitute the five limbs of Diksha and if you practice it every day then you will overcome Vikshapta Chitta, restless mind and Kadarya Shil, bad habits. And then the power that was in the Holy Name, the Holy Name was always powerful but you couldn't, ex you couldn't experience that power. Just like the sun is hot, but if you live in a cave, you cannot experience it. So, the power of the name and Kirtan and Harikata is always there and can always give in everything. But our consciousness was covered by these uh, bad habits and restlessness. So once that problem is solved by these five samskars of Diksha, then you can experience the real power of the holy name, Kirtan and Harikata, and then Krishna prayer. Yes, and Nadi Kastavu, we came here because the wind was Trinavarta came <laughs> with the clouds of dust. <laughs> I'm not sure if I understood right, but once you mentioned that one can see no, in, in, in a devotee, like from certain symptoms, that in this life he will attain up to Nishta and, and uh, from other things that these are able to go. You can see 
Kanishka cannot. Madhya Madhikari can judge. You see, this is the difference between Madhya, middle level, and Konishta. Konishta cannot judge. But when a person receives Diksha and they start to follow it, then the door to Madhya Madhikari is open. And the person who is following the process of Diksha nicely can go through. And then they can, uh, to a certain degree, they can understand who is Konishta Adhikari, who is unsteady, who has some philosophical misconception. And uh, very and an artist, and then they can see someone who is very very steady, mind is never disturbed, always absorbed in bhaktis. They can see Madhyam Adhikari, and they cannot. Who is Uttam Bhagavat? No one can tell. Hmm? No one can tell. Another Uttam Bhagavat may tell, but even he may not recognize. Sometimes <laughs> because it's like a lila, you know. <laughs> so, um, but. There are some symptoms when a person has a power to move the hearts of others and they quickly become devotees. Then you should think that they are very advanced. Because it's not ordinary. It's not normal. Not a material thing. To bring the living beings into the path of bhakti. And Krishna Shakti Dina Nanitara Pravatan, Vallabhacharya in Chaitanya Sarvati said to Mahaprabhu, that without Krishna Shakti, anyone cannot actually spread the, the chanting of the Holy Spirit. So, this. Sokolo Saman, Koriti Shakti Deo Nato Jato Jata. Oh, Gode, please uh, give me the ability to honor everyone but according to their stage. Mm -hmm. So, juniors are honored, but you should show mercy to those who are junior. And those who are your peers, you should honor them, but with friendship. And for those who are seniors, you should honor them, but with service. And so we interact with three types of devotees. We may not know their exact stage, but we should be intelligent enough to know whether they are junior, equal or more advanced than us. And honor them accordingly, and then we'll progress very nicely. I was wondering, uh, while our Gurudev was still in the manifest past times, did he mention that he would come again as a guru and um, help his disciples in future births or any other? Because it's an eternal lila to be a guru. Or? Yes. Chakudan Dilojay Janme Janme Prabhu he opened my eyes as my guru life after life. So, but the transcendental things are very mysterious. They have no limitation on them. So, for example, your guru may not be Rupa Goswami, but you are serving and hearing your guru. And at any moment, Rupa Goswami can enter into him and instruct him. Because a Guru Tattva is one. So in any pure Vaishnava, at some times, no, Baladevi Dibhushan may be speaking. Sometimes Srila Bhakti Nur Thakur may be speaking. Sometimes Rupa Goswami may be speaking. Sometimes Prabhupada Bhakti Stansu Thakur may be speaking. Like this. So Guru Tattva is not a very limited material thing. It is transcendental. There is no limitation of time and space. The absolute realm is absolute and can appear in many different ways. There is many names and labels that I didn't uh, mm. understand. Yes. But just I'm flowing with the, yes. the Shakti and the love. Yes. I was wondering about, uh, you talked just before about the self-realization, mm. but in my case, to really attain self-realization in this back to the path, uh, what should be my sadhana yes. properly? You should take shelter of the Guru and then try to... I recognize yes. you as my Guru. Yes, yes, you can follow me. I'll give you my Pranam Mantra. That is a mantra, only it is a mantra by which you address your Guru and uh, it gives some meditation on the personality, the identity, the qualities of Guru. It makes a connection. Then try to be uh, with us as much as you can and render service. And the Guru watches the disciple for one year. 
It's like a testing time. Because to enter the path of bhakti, a person should be very humble and very sincere. So it's actually very easy to be humble and sincere for one or two days. But to maintain it, it's more difficult, you see, because a person can easily be very and explode, you know, for some reason, some small reason. That's not necessarily um, a disqualification because we all have some weaknesses in the beginning. But if a person uh, will, let's say, they become intolerant or angry, upset about something, but then afterwards they feel some regret, I made a mistake, it shows that they're sincere. So failing is not a problem. But becoming humble about one's failings, then this is a sign of sincerity that we want to correct ourselves. So the disciple, the guru watches the disciple, their behavior, their mentality, how they are sincere and serving for one year. But that's not only the time when the guru is testing the disciple, but the disciples also testing the guru. You can watch the guru, see how they're serving, how they're absorbed how they're not doing any worldly activities, how they're detached from any material pleasures, and ask questions to see whether this spiritual master really knows the Vedas, Vedanta, Upanishad, all the Vedic literatures very, very thoroughly and understands the essence of them. So that year, it's called the Guru Pada Shrine, the shelter, taking shelter year, is a Guru and disciple are getting to know each other, making a strong relationship and building confidence and faith in each other. And then after that year, if Guru is satisfied, then he can give an initiation, the first initiation. Um, that is the, the Maha Mantra. But even before you receive that Maha Mantra officially or formally, you should begin to chant. You can um, find out, you can speak to one of our devotees. Oh, you have a Japa Mal. It's kind of page. Let me see. It seems to be that uh, this Mala is made of a Chanda. Sandalwood, you know? Yeah, yeah, sandalwood. Yeah, yeah, sandalwood. Yes. So it's very nice. You can chant on this Mala. Um, Always I have to use the same mala because at my house I have another of the stones. I recommend that you get Tosi. I have a Tosi mala. Rudrushka. Uh, Rudraksha. Rudraska. No. Rudraksha is for the mantras to Lord Shiva. Ah, to Lord Shiva. To Lord Shiva, yes. So if someone is uh, doing Ashtanga Yoga or worshipping Lord Shiva, then their, their mala is Rudraksha. Okay. And they're very rough. Yes, yes. Huh? And by touching this rough mala, your heart may become rough also. <laughs> so you should be better. Its best mala is any mala you can use. This mala you can use. But best in the future or at the time of your initiation, you should have a Tulsi mala. You see, because there are different uh, plants which are used for worshipping different deities. So Shiva is worshipped with Rudraksha and with bell fruit. Durga is worshipped with hibiscus flowers, you know, red hibiscus flowers with the that, you know. And but all the forms of Bhagavan, whether it's Krishna, Ram, Narayan, all the forms of Bhagavan, uh, they're all worshipped with Tulsi. Perhaps you've seen it's a, a plant and very, very fragrant. So the malas which are made of Tulsi are very powerful for the worship of any form of Bhagavan, especially Krishna. Because Krishna's transcendental world is called the Vrindavan. Vrindavan, yes, Vrindavan. Like the city where he born. Yes. So it's a forest actually. A very rural place. So Van means forest. And Brinda is a goddess. Brinda. Brinda. She's a goddess of the forest. Of that forest, yes. So that Brinda incarnates in this world in the form of the Tulsi plant. And that's why all Vaishnavas, they worship the Tulsi And they use the Mala, because this Mala connects them with the transcendental forest where Krishna is playing. In the south of India also there is a lot of Tulsi. In, yes. In Ama uh, Ashram there is many Tulsi. Yes, and yes. For this reason, yes. it's your tradition that Vaishnavas in India, outside their house, they have like a platform and Tulsi growing there. They're all here. This, this master Amma also she realized uh, chanting Krishna 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 she get the, the, the realization of the Krishna with uh, Krishna. Yeah. Amma she, yeah, she explained in this in his yes. biography that she was uh, mm -hmm. from his uh, from childhood worshiping Krishna. Yes yes yes. 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 
So God has many forms, but uh, Krishna is the original form from which all the other forms come. Uh, so this is explained in, in, in Bhagavad Gita. Aham sarvasya prabhavo mataksavam prabhavate. All spiritual and material existences come from me. Mata parataram nandyat kintidasti dananjaya. There is no reality superior to me. Everything rests upon me like pearls are strung upon a thread. Deva Deva Jagatpate. Oh, Arjun says, Krishna, you are the God of all the gods. So there are many places in, in Gita and in the in the Bhagavad Purana, the commentary of Vedanta. It is said, Ete Changsa Kalakumsa Krishna's two Bhagavan Swayam. There are many expansions and expansions of expansions of God. Like Nishingadev, Ram, Kurma, Varaha, Kalki, Buddha, even Buddha is one avatar. Jesus? Jesus, uh -huh. he is not uh, considered to be Bhagavan, but considered to be an, um, a great devotee, a great guru, who is Shaktyavesh, that means the power of God entered into him to teach the world about devotion. So we recognize Jesus as a Shaktyavesh avatar. Uh, uh, yeah, an avatar, but Shaktivesh. Mm -hmm. Avatar means God Himself comes in a spiritual form. incarnation. Yeah. God Himself comes in a form that is called Avatar. And Shaktivesh means there's a great Guru, and the, only the Shakti of God enters into Him and uses Him like an instrument to touch people. That's how we relate to Jesus. Oh, I'm telling what you should do, because you said what should you do now to do to practice. Yeah. So, you rise up early in the morning, take bath, and you should sit and do chant japa. Oh, this Mahamantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Try to go round 108 from the, the bead, there's one head bead. Start on one side and go 108, yes, this way, and then turn around and go 108 that way. So, this is one mala. Then two malas, okay. three sides. malas, okay. like that, and do as much as you can. Yeah. Um, for initiation, you have to build up to 16 malas a day, 16 malas. So that's approximately, because there are, because there are 16 names of Krishna in the Mahamantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna. If you do go around 16 times, it will be about 25,000 names of Krishna every day. And then you'll make very good progress. You should read um, Bhagavad Gita. If you send me an email, I can send you a link to some... In the Spanish? No, uh, yeah. You, uh, you can read in Spanish or English as you like. No, I will read in Spanish. I think in my mother's house I have Bhagavad Gita Talkwales from a uh, city... Uh, Swami Prabhupada. 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 Prabhupada, yes, yes. But this one is... Good. Because there are hundreds of translations and some of them are quite... <laughs> not very good. Yeah. And some translations are good, but the explanation is wrong. But this this Bhagavad Gita by Prabhupada, you can trust it completely. Yeah, yeah and I, in Barcelona, I have a very good friend of his by Nava, is a Mahayana. Oh, wow. and you know Mahayana? Yeah, he, he also helps me mm. in my spiritual path. Yes, yes. Yeah, and sometimes we discuss about Vaisnavas and some, you know, um, um, the Vedanta. Uh, Philosophy. Yeah, Advaita Vedanta, only one. Yes, so Advaita Vedanta, you should be at a distance from this. Yeah, yeah, now, now I change my, my feeling through all this process that I have lived. But some time ago, when I was uh, in India with Bhagavan, I was following him and very experienced. So it's good that you, that you have the interest in Vedanta. But the Advaita Vedanta was it was composed by um, one Vinyasa, sage. Vinyasa. Uh, his, no, the, the Vedanta Sutra was uh, composed by Vyasa. Yes, Vyasa. Veda Vyasa. Veda Vyasa. Was Ram, no? Uh, no, no, no. He is one incarnation of Krishna who manifests to, yeah. to write the Vedanta. But the Advaita Vedanta, this explanation, was composed by a sage named Shankaracharya. 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 Yeah, I, I read about. He was um, born in um, 788 AD and he lived for 32 years until 820 AD. And you see, what happened at that time, Buddhism was very popular in India. 
and Buddhists don't believe in the Vedas. So Shankaracharya taught a philosophy which was very close to Buddhism, but using the Vedanta as the praman, as the evidence. And in this way he brought the people back to faith in the Vedas. So, Advaita Vedanta is, see to move them, what he said had to be very close to the Buddhist idea, to bring them back into faith in the in Vedanta and in Veda. So, um, but it was not at the conclusion. Then after him, another sage came named Ramanujacharya and Madhvacharya, others came. And then they took the persons a step further, away from the impersonal idea and into the very personal and devotional idea. So Vedanta, many people think it's uh, philosophy, very high. high. It's true it's a high philosophy, but they also think it's impersonal. But uh, Vedanta is very personal, actually. In Vedanta you have sutras like Ananda Mayopyasat, which means that, that uh, the Supreme Truth is full of Ananda, full of joy. Uh, so, something which is, has no personality cannot be joyful. Also in Vedanta it is said, Guham Pravistav Atmanohi Dashati. In every heart there are two souls. That means Atma and Paramat, both. Uh, in Vedanta Sutra it says that Lokavat tu lila kaivalyam, the Supreme Truth, plays like a human being. So, uh, these sutras, they cannot, if you take the direct meaning, they cannot be impersonal. You can only take, make it into something impersonal if you take an uh, allegorical meaning. Um, if you take a secondary meaning, a metaphorical meaning from the sutras. But with sutra literature, it's the nature of sutra is not poetry. With poetry you can take a metaphorical meaning. But sutras are very direct philosophy. And so one should not take what is called the Gona Arta, secondary meaning. You have to take what is called Mukya Arta, the direct meaning. So if you take the sutras, the direct meaning, as you should do with the sutra literature, then the Danta Sutra is very personal. What about Ramana Maharshi? Ramana Ma Maharshi is kind of his teaching was the, the conclusion. The conclusion is saying like Advaita Vedanta. Yes. Same like, but he didn't fully follow Shankaracharya. He didn't really fully follow anyone. He was like a very spontaneous. But in the end, the conclusions of Ramana Maharshi and Shankaracharya are the same. That is the uh, impersonal emptiness, a state of nirvana. So this, like I said, when you go into this, it is as if you become haunted by a ghost. Because you think everything is an illusion and someone's trying to give a good instruction, but you cannot listen because you think that person is also an illusion, everything is illusion. You ignore everything. So it's like a, you go into a trap that you cannot come out. And uh, as I described this morning, I described four ways in which the impersonal conception is completely incoherent and, so, and unacceptable. So uh, our Chaitanya, the golden avatar Chaitanya, he said, which means Vyas has written the Vedanta Sutra to help you come out of illusion. But if you uh, study the interpretation of Shankaracharya, the impersonal interpretation, everything is lost. Everything is lost. So even though it's very popular, but it's Kali Yuga. And in Kali Yuga, ideas which are very wrong are also very popular. The popularity does not approve the substance of the idea. You have to examine the idea for its own substance, not because many people like it. So, but what we find is that many persons go through the stage of Advaita Vedanta on the way to the Bhakti Vedanta. Yes, yes, yes absolutely. And uh, in the Vedas, there are um, very beautiful histories of sages who went through the impersonal stage on the way to the personal stage. See? Because at least the personal stage, the impersonal stage, though it's not the goal, but it is, um, we can say, helps you become detached from the material world. So some persons, they have material attachment and they go directly to Bhakti and they attain Krishna. 
But others, they go more step by step. They first become detached from the world by the impersonal conception and then become attached to God afterwards. For example, uh, there were four sages. Then they, they famous in India as called the four Kumaras. And by their yoga siddhi, by their mystic power, from childhood they didn't grow up, they remained like children. Because when you grow up, then sex desire comes and you become entangled with so many things. So by their yoga cities they stayed young. And they didn't wear any clothing. <laughs> In India children run around with no clothing, you know. So they were sages, they have no clothing, and they, though they're very old, they look very young. So one day, by the mercy of their guru, Brahma, they came to the uh, gate of Vaikuntha, to the gate they were flying through space, and they came to the gate of the spiritual world. And then there were some guards there, and they said, so you can't come in, you are not dressed properly. <laughs> <laughs> so they said, Do you are, have such a big ego, why are you seeing external things? We are sages, we are always absorbed in the Brahman, in light. Why are you seeing the external things? An argument came. So when this argument was going on, then the personal form of Bhagavan, eh? that is uh, a form of Krishna called Narayan, a four-armed form, he approached them. And as he approached, all of them bowed down. And when those sages bowed down, the fragrance of the uh, tosi uh, leaves that was in the garland of Lord Narayan, eh? that transcendental fragrance, entered into their nostrils. Now, because their minds was, were absorbed in the light of Brahman, they never became excited. They were always very peaceful. Shanta. 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 Wow. Peaceful. But when this fragrance, transcendental fragrance of Supreme Lord entered their nostrils, then their minds became excited, became agitated. And they experienced a happiness which was higher than nirvana, higher than liberation. So they said, Tasya Ravinda Nayanasya Pada Ravinda Kinjalka Mishta Tulasi Makaranda Vayu. The, the meaning is that the breeze carried the fragrance of the beautiful garland of the Lord. It entered into their nose and then their hearts, Sanshobam Akshara Dushamma Pichitta Tango, their hearts began to tremble. And they feel, felt such a joy. And after that, they became devotees. They were no longer interested in just meditating, just trying to give up the ego, mature ego, and go into light. It was very inferior in comparison with this higher transcendental experience. So there are many examples like this you can find in the Bhagavad Purana and, uh, and in the histories of the saints. But you never find those old bhaktas doing bhakti converting to Advaita Vedanta. It never happens. Only those from Advaita Vedanta, they always, after some time, they think, oh, I'm not really happy. And they see the devotees, they think, this is beautiful. And, and they become devotees. So always the progress is in this way. It never goes the other way. So up until now in your life, it served a good purpose. But now you have to keep growing, keep evolving. And they tell you something. Um, the realization of the light is not an, that is not an illusion, it's true. But it's just a preliminary realization of Krishna. Okay, give an example. Let's say that for many years you were trapped in a dark cave. And you never saw any light for many years. Then one day you escaped and you went outside. So when you come outside, then what will you see? Light. You see, yeah, you see nothing but light because your eyes are not just the ordinary. It will, just, it will be blinding. <clears throat> you cannot see. And gradually, gradually, you adjust, and then you start to make out some shapes. And then afterwards, then you come in focus. So in the same way, when a soul is in this material world, it's like a darkness. And when they rise above the illusion, then they're approaching the truth. Uh, but uh, first they see light. Only, but it doesn't mean that that is the last word in the truth. It's only what they experience when they're coming out of the darkness. And then they begin to see some shape. So the light is called Brahman. 
Then when they begin to see some shape, they see that God is a person, that is Paramatma. And then when their focus becomes very, very fine and crisp, then they see Bhagavan, Krishna. So the light is really the light, the aura of God. It's just the aura coming from the body of God. Then Paramatma is God in the form with which by which he creates this material world, uh, nature, material nature, yes. And then Bhagavan is, that is Krishna, that is God in his own world, in his own reality, completely uh, beyond any connection with the material world. So in the commentary on Vedanta, it is said, Vedanti tattvavitas tattvam yajjjnam advayam brahmeti paramatmeti bhagavan iti shabdite. The truth is one, but it's realized in three stages. First Brahman, the light, then Paramatma, Ishwara, the controller of the world, and then Bhagavan, God in his own. Is Brahma Vishnu and Shiva the same? No. No, no, no. Brahma Vishnu and Shiva, that is connected to three gunas. In this world, there are three gunas, Sattva, Rajas and Tamas. So there is one form of God who is the controller of each one. So Shiva controls Tamas, destruction. And when it's time for the universe to be dissolved, then Shiva does his dance, you know, the Tandava Nitya, and he expands with so many Rudras who are very angry, and they dissolve the whole universe. So Shiva is in charge of Tamagun, ignorance. Brahma is in charge of Rajagun, creation. So uh, every time the universe is destroyed, then it is manifested again, it goes in cycles. So Shiva destroys, and then after some time, Brahma in his meditation and with by the power of Rajagun, then he does the creation. He cannot create the ingredients of the world. That means earth, water, fire, air and space. Only God can do that. Bhagavan. But Brahma, he is the first being in the universe and in by the power of his meditation, he combines the elements to make all the shapes that we see. All the forms of animals, the forms of human beings, the form of devatas and angels, like that. So, Brahma's role as the deity of Rajagun, passion, is the secondary creation. Not the ingredients, but the combination of the ingredients. Mm -hmm. So, just like if you cook, the farmer gives the ingredients and the chef <laughs> puts them together. So, God is like the farmer who gives the ingredients and Brahma is like the cook. Puts them together. And the relation that you said before about Brahma and the Ishvara. Oh, Brahman, uh, uh, these are two different things. Yeah, Brahman. Brahman, 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 both A's are short, Brahman, and it means the light emanating from God. Okay, one thing is Brahman but and the other thing is Dhamma. Brahma. Brahma. That, in the, when, that is Lord Brahma who does the creation. In this, the second A is long. First A should Brahma, Brahma. In Sanskrit there are two A's. A, A, I, I, U, U, O, O, A, A, O, A, I. Kachitatapa, kachitatapa, gadatatapa, ganyananama, yaralava, sasasha, ha. That's the entire Sanskrit alphabet. Okay? So, 56 letters. Um, so, the, and the first two letters are the short A and the long A. So, Brahman is the name of the light coming from uh, God. And then afterwards there is Paramatma. That means you begin to see a form there. It is Ishwar, the control of the world. And that is the Vishnu. In Brahma, Shiva and Vishnu, hmm, Shiva is Tamagun, Brahma is Rajagun, and Vishnu controls Sattva, the balance. So Brahma is like the big bang when the light is closed. And um, you know what No, means? yes, yes, no. Because then, in the Bible says the first was the light, no? Mm. So the first was the In the beginning word. was the Word. In the beginning yes. was the Word, and the Word mm -hmm. was God, and with God, yeah. and created. Yeah. The, 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 in the Bible the word is Logos. Yeah. Yeah. Logos, Logos yeah. means uh, the, the, the reason, the, the intellect, yeah. the, the reasonableness of God is not different from so and it said that that logos appeared as jesus yes that jesus is uh, reveals to us god's wisdom the incarnation of god's wisdom so um, as far as the big bang is concerned uh, there is a description similar to that in the vedas but brahma the creator is not part of that brahma comes a little bit afterwards because it said that the that the universe is they start very small and they expand 
And so that's essentially the scientists discovered that the, the universe is expanding, so it must have come from a point. So the Vedas say, like that, the universe starts small and expands. But then after a certain time, it begins to contract and goes back into a point again. You see? So once the universe begins to expand and is expanded to a certain point, the elements are there and then Brahma combines them and makes the objects. So the actual, if you like, the Vedic Big Bang, or the first expansion of the universe, is done by God. And then the actual construction of the, of the parts within the universe is done by Brahma. Brahma. Um, Yes, in that sense, I, I like that, that so scientific uh, thing. In my conception from, from that cosmology, uh, the, 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 the intelligence itself in the universe evolves in that con in conception. I don't know in the Vedanta if the perfection is also evolving or the perfection is, uh, is always already perfect. I don't know if I explain myself. Yes, yes. The, the, the intelligence of God which is present in the world is always uh, uh, present and perfect, but like a flower, eh? like all the information of a flower is there in the seed, but it's not fully open. So in the same way, the universe, like a lotus flower, is uh, blossoming. Eh? That means more and more is being revealed. So actually, the, the deep secrets of the Vedas, very profound mysteries of the Vedas. Even in ancient times, some of them were not revealed. But there's an ongoing revelation of God's wisdom. As you are saying, there's an ongoing revelation. So God's wisdom is always perfect. But it's not always manifested every time. So when the universe expands, there's more and more revelation of God's wisdom as well. So that aspect is yes, we agree. So it's evolving in a, in a certain way, no? The, yes. The wisdom of the God. Yes. From the expansion. I'll evolving. give an example. In ancient times, when persons were worshiping Bhagavan, yeah. they they knew about Krishna, but mainly they focused on Narayan, that is a four-arm form, uh, where God is all-powerful, all-pervading, all-knowing, and they worshipped him as their as a servant. But now, as the universe is going on, time is going on, a deeper revelation is that actually Krishna, who seems very human and playing like a human being, he is the more complete conception of God. Because not only does he have servants, but he also has friendship. He also has parental love. He also has romantic love. All the different flavors of love, the com complete spectrum of all the types of emotions are possible towards Krishna. So, though the uh, Krishna's Leela was described in the Vedas before, but it was just the intelligence of the sages within the universe was not um, focused on that. And now, as time goes on, there's been more and more um, inclination of the great sages to appear in this world and reveal a fuller picture of devotional service. And so especially Krishna appeared as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu 500 years ago and then he really opened more than ever before. And, and what he revealed, it wasn't that it wasn't written in the Vedas, it was just that the time had not come yet for the, the sages, for the devotees to realize the deep meaning of those words. So we're in a very fortunate time, a very lucky time in history. Uh, now is the best time. The, the process is, relatively speaking, much easier than the previous ages. And also the goal which comes from this process is much higher. Uh, to become very close to, to in the service of Radha and Krishna. It is miraculous. For example, Brahma, in the in the commentary on Vedanta, he says, Tad bhuri bhagyam hiya janma ki mafyatavyam yad gokul api katamangri rajo vishekam It means, oh, I would be lucky if I could become even a blade of grass or a stone in Krishna's Vrindavan. So now Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is giving us a chance to become like Krishna's beloveds, very, very close to Krishna. But back then, 5,000 years ago, Lord Brahma, who is more qualified than us, he said, oh, if I could just become a, a, a grass or a flower in Vrindavan, I would consider myself very lucky. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu opened the door to deep opp opportunities and a, a much a closer relationship with Krishna.
What the meaning of Chaitanya? Chaitanya means consciousness. That's why our academy is called Chaitanya Academy. It has two meanings. One is we follow the teachings of Chaitanya. And the other meaning is something that's relevant for everyone. Consciousness. Right? What does everyone have in common? You know, everyone is different. Mm? And even animals and, and trees. Th there's one thing that unites us all and that is consciousness. But our consciousness is in degrees of expansion. You see, consciousness expands and contracts. So when consciousness is contracted, then we have very little understanding. We have some very rudimentary awareness, but not a deep understanding. And consciousness slowly expands. The animal's consciousness is more expanded than, say, the consciousness of a tree. Mm -hmm. And, uh, as, for example, a dog is more conscious than a fish. Mm -hmm. An elephant is more conscious than a dog. Dolphins have more, and whales, they have more. So there, there are degrees, the consciousness expands, the ability to think expands. And when you get human life, then it's more expanded. But, but, in, but, in, <laughs> but in the humanity, people are not uh, yes, conscious. Because, because expanded, <laughs> expanded consciousness, expanded consciousness means your intelligence can function. Yeah. But what happens is people misuse their intelligence. They use that developed intelligence for evil. You see, if a if a lion wants to kill you, he will just uh, bite you. But if a man wants to kill, he can make a machine gun and just kill many many people. Because he has developed intelligence, and so the consequences of misusing the intelligence are more extreme. Hmm? So it's a great responsibility to be blessed by God with human intelligence. And we should use that intelligence very wisely uh, in understanding who we are. So when we utilize our intelligence in searching for God, God sends Guru to us. He blesses us with some intelligence to understand the words of Guru and the good intelligence to practice. But what happens is, as you practice, the intelligence expands, the consciousness expands more and more. And the fullest expansion of consciousness is called brain, love. Brain. Yeah, brain, love. When the consciousness is fully expanded, it becomes, the heart becomes very soft and uh, spontaneously attracted to serving Krishna. And while, uh, so that's why it's called the Chaitanya, Chaitanya Academy. Yeah. Because one, we follow Chaitanya, and two, our subject is the subject of consciousness and how to expand it to its fullest potential. And more, more, more Chaitanya you get, or more awareness you get, more responsible have you been in interactions. Yes. yes and also, when you and when you fail in direction, more karma you have. Exactly. That's but, exactly the situation. If you have uh, yeah, but this more is like, understanding. Yeah. Then you have more responsibility, so that you are held to be more responsible. Just like but sometimes the ego, no, because when, when consciousness expands, when consciousness expands, the ego d dissolves. The ego dissolves. The the ego is actually one contraction of consciousness. It's a con it's one aspect of contraction. It's a darkness. So the the um, expansion of consciousness it leads to the gradual dissolution of the ego. But it's correct, with more knowledge comes more responsibility. Just like if there's a child and they walk into a shop and they pick up some a pencil or something and they walk out, yeah. then the shopkeeper will come, take the pencil and just give us like, don't do that again. But if an adult will go in and take a pencil, they'll call the police. <laughs> no? Because he should know better. So, with more knowledge comes more responsibility. Uh, I have a stupid question, sorry. But uh, why 16 mala? Why not uh, 12 or 14 or 18? Why 16 or 64 when advanced? It's not a, it's not a fixed number. Mm -hmm. But you have to fix some number. In other words, uh, otherwise you will not come to a certain level and not slip back. So our Acharyas, no, let's say to chant 16 rounds, takes about between one and a half to two hours. For me, I feel much more because if I spend 12, I do only eight. Uh -huh. so then you must be chanting very slowly, <laughs> but as you, no, you can chant a little faster, but no need. As you become more absorbed, the name will flow by itself. 
and the speed you will not be in control. Sometimes, oh, and sometimes, rah. You, you cannot control it. But right now you are doing mechanically, so it's taking you long. But as you become more absorbed, name will start to take over, and it will sometimes be very fast or slow. Then, so it's not important. But uh, the idea is that it's called Sankhya Purvakanam, means completing a fixed number. So at least you make progress and you stay there, you don't slide back. And from that point you always do more. And uh, so our Acharyas have ascertained that for commitment, for initiation, at least this commitment to complete 16 rounds is a good level of commitment. It shows a good level of sincerity. Uh, but you should chant more if you can. I start with 16 every day, no? It's a good... Starting with 16 is very good. Yeah. We don't, if someone starts with 4 or 8, it's nice. But if you can start from 16, then this is very good. You are on a good platform to uh, rapidly make progress. Hmm? Because the more that you invest into this process, the more you will get out of it. Yeah? Really, it's proportional. <laughs> When I have day off, I do 16, but when I have a good work, a bit less. Ah, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, if you can start from 16 and not do less every day, you'll, you'll be very happy, you'll progress on this. I will try to do my best. <laughs> So our friend, he was asking about uh, cosmology, the questions of cosmology. Mm -hmm. The interaction uh, with the scientific community is something that uh, the religions have not been, uh, to this day, not very successful. There's a, there's a perception that religion is one thing and science is something else. But it's very artificial understanding. Knowledge is knowledge. And what we are calling science is just one methodology. But we have to recognize what are the strengths of that methodology and what are the weaknesses of that methodology. And when you identify what are the strengths of the scientific methodology but also the weaknesses, then you understand that it doesn't pose a challenge to the spiritual conception of life at all. It doesn't pose a challenge. Because many of the things which are addressed in the religious sphere are actually outside of the scope of the scientific methodology. And uh, the scientific methodology as it stands today is not complete. What we find mainly is scientists study maths, but they're not very good at philosophy. And they, we find that many scientists, they're very naive on philosophical analysis. And so Though science itself tells us nothing about the existence or the non-existence of God, but just a very naive philosophical interpretation of the scientific results looks as if it's supporting some atheistic conclusion. But it's, it's not a fact. Uh, and so, uh, here at a festival everyone is coming, they're relaxing. I don't make the students work hard. But when I'm giving lectures in a university or in other contexts, Sometimes I give very, very exact and scientific lectures with, with a big screen and with animations and diagrams and everything to exactly um, define what are the strengths and the weaknesses of, of science and what are the various correct and incorrect interpretations and then uh, making the synthesis of the scientific approach and the approach of Vedanta. So, um, my, the videos of my seminars in various universities, they're available online. If that's, if that's your field of interest, write an email to me and say, I'm really interested in cosmology and science and religion, these things, and I'll send you the links for those particular lectures. But uh, in a, in, when you have a very big, big audience at a place like this, then maybe in the audience two or three people appreciate that, and the other 97% you lose them. So, uh, you have, I have to try to speak in such a way that uh, it's like an umbrella that everyone in the audience has an interest in that topic. Yeah, yeah because one thing is the uh, cos cosmogony that you have, and the other thing is how this cosmogony can help in your daily life. No? Yes. So it's like two different, sometimes they can link, but sometimes they are different things. No? Philosophy is, yes. maybe it's not useful for daily life, or maybe yes, no? it depends. Yes, yes. And, uh, 
we find that uh, a person's some persons don't just they don't think actually about cosmology they just it's not something that they think about uh, but those who do usually it's an extension or a projection of their own identity what they feel the nature of themselves and they project on the universe uh, and uh, we'll find also very often persons they have ideas which are inconsistent which are contradictory but no one ever pointed out the contradiction in their ideas that's what Socrates was very famous. I just want to say something. That our friend here looks exactly like Socrates. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know nothing. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, don't know, I, don't, I don't know nothing. Have you seen the statue of Socrates? Yes. Because in our Chaitanya Academy, we, we like to do dramas. So if you, one day we do a drama of Socrates, you should play the part. <laughs> <laughs> but, not, but not the last part. <laughs> Don't worry, it will just be the uh, uh, fruit juice. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but the last part is very important. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because what is Socrates, Socrates saying? Actually, you cannot kill me because I am spiritual. Mm -hmm. I am transcendental. And I have had previous lives and I have a future life. So I'm not afraid of it. The disciples were crying. But Socrates was happy. He never thought that um, now life is over and there's nothing. His last words were, Oh, uh, can you offer a chicken to Asclepius? There's one, there was one temple of a, of a god, a Greek god named Asclepius. And he had promised to give a chicken to that temple. So you were, he's about to die. And you will think, well, this is irrelevant because you're dead now. What do I? No. But he was thinking, no, there's a continuity of life. So if I made a promise, then I should fulfill it. Because if you don't keep your promises in your next life, someone will break your promise to you. Like this. So it seems like the last word that he said were very uh, like trivial. But deeply, you see, it was actually not trivial. It was an extension of his understanding that life does not end with death. Consciousness is eternal and continuous and never affected by material circumstances. So I love Socrates very much. So when I see him, I feel so much love. What we feel, what we think and what we say have to be the same in the same yes. Yes, we and must and be what? consistent in our words and thoughts and deeds. Socrates was also not only a philosopher, he was very brave. And sometimes? He was very brave. Sometimes he had to fight for Greece. And once one of his uh, friends, uh, Archibiades, he was injured in a battle and was fallen and dying. And many enemies were around him. And Socrates came in the middle and fought them all off and picked up his injured friend. Uh, and he carried him to safety. Uh, so he was not only a philosopher, but a man of action. Yes, he was a man of action. So we should be like this also. We should not only be philosophers, but we should be people of action. We should care about others and be active in the world to create the atmosphere and the opportunities where others can enter deeply into Vedic knowledge, have an opportunity to be touched by the vibration of the mantra of the holy names and uh, awake and expand their consciousness to know themselves and to know God. So it's very good to be thoughtful, but also be active in Krishna's service. I am saying this because I was just in, I was just recently in St. Petersburg. In Russia. In the St. Petersburg. And there is a, a, one place called Mikhailovsky Palace. And they have a big art gallery. So I went there to see the religious art and I saw one very big painting, just like the size of this wall. And I looked and I saw it was a Socrates with a sword carrying his friend on his shoulder and saying, it was, so it was just, it was just in my mind. And I was thinking, oh yes, just see. One should not only be a philosopher, but be an action, an action in life to help others. So we're having a festival and I think it's in August in St. Petersburg. So if you have the chance to go, the festival will be very nice. 
St. Petersburg is like Venice, you know, all canals everywhere around the city. So we have, in Russia, we cannot do the Sankirtan in through the streets. So we rent a big boat with an open top and loudspeakers. And all the devotees come in the boat and we do kirtan on the canals through the streets. Because it's not illegal, because our boat is a private party. Yeah, but still everyone can, everyone can hear the kirtan. The last time we did that was during the World Cup. So St. Petersburg was one of the main centers for the World Cup. So there were millions of people there from all over the world. And we could do Harinath and share the kirtan with everyone. So we'll do that, we're doing that also this year. In, uh, it's in August. Yes. ¿Y la persona cuando escucha el, el canto del Santo Nombre? Puede que en ese momento no le, no le haga nada, pero tarde o temprano ese, ese, eso que ha escuchado florecerá. When the, when the person hears the, the chanting of the holy name, maybe in that moment it doesn't make any nothing, but uh, when the times go, this uh, this yes this uh, expands. Yes, yes. Let's say you are doing kirtan in, for example, Madrid. We'll, when we go to Madrid, I think on the on Sunday. We'll go to the market in the center of Madrid. And many people are there. And thousands of people will hear the name. And when this vibration goes in the ear, then it neutralizes the power of all their karmas. Just like every person, their choices and their movements are dictated from the subconscious mind. And the subconscious mind is in collection of many samskars, impressions of past life activities. So the choices, the thoughts, the things that we're doing now are like echoes of our past activities. This is how karma works. Now, when a person hears the holy name, even though all their samskars, impressions in the subconscious mind are still there, but the substance within them has been removed. So they appear to act the same, they appear to feel the same. But these impressions cannot have the same effect on them. The example given in the Vedas is, if you have a rope, let's say a rope is in a coil. So you pour some uh, ghee or some uh, petrol, gasoline on there and light it with a match. It goes up in flames. When the flames die down, you'll see the rope is still there, but it's black. Mm -hmm. You see the shape of the rope, but it's completely black. And if you touch it, it collapses into ash. It can, you cannot tie anyone or anything with that rope anymore. But it looks the same until you touch it. So in the same way, when anyone at this festival, so many hundreds of people, the mantra went into their ear. And they're going on with their life. They feel that they are the same person. But at the end of their life, when they come to die, then that karma is supposed to carry them to the next life. But that their karma is now like ash. And they will be liberated. <coughs> they will be liberated. So it's the greatest benefit you can give to someone to make them hear the holy name. Is there an the effect on them only uh, hearing from pure devotees? Or even like if I always chant at home my family, they hear me, there is effect on them? It is there from pure devotee. And is there, if a pure devotee tells someone, go and chant. Because some power of them comes through that process. So if you're not perfect, no harm, just go and do kirtan. If your guru has told you. Uh, I remember once we were in... Let me see. It was... It was Verbania in Italy. You know, Lago Maggiore is in the north of Italy. It's very big, like Lago Maggiore. And on the shore of Lago Maggiore, there's a uh, very beautiful, small medieval town called Verbania. So one year my guru came there, and uh, that year his health was not so good. So he didn't visit many places in Europe. It was one festival for the whole of Europe. So devotees came from everywhere. There was about a thousand devotees. And uh, my Gurudev told uh, all of you now, with your instruments, you should go out into the city of the town of Urbania and do kirtan everywhere. So at that time, there was a devotee, she's a very famous artist, named Shamarani. 
So she said, if I go and chant there, then my chanting is not pure. So what effect will it have on the people? Uh, then my Gurudev said, I told you to go. So my power will be in that chanting when you follow my instruction. Was a very amazing kirtan. And it was you were there, right? And it was really something very special. Sanidhi Maharaj, yourself, and so many, and everyone was taking turns, and and people were looking from the balconies, and they were waving. And, and when the kirtan came back from the town and began to go up the hill to the um, the center where the festival was, Gurudev came out on his balcony in the distance and was waving. We also. <laughs> it was incredible potency in that kid. We all can never forget. Was anyone else there? Yes. You were there also. Yeah. Oh. Vavanya. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, so I hope everyone is satisfied with our visit to Barcelona. I am very satisfied that I met with new friends and also with old friends I had not seen for a long time and uh, I am very satisfied with our kirtans, our classes. I pray that our Guru Prampara, that they are pleased with the service that, we have, that you have all done and I have tried to do and they will bless us. And now today and tomorrow we are relocating to the University of Mysticism of St. Teresa de Avila. Have you been to Avila? Oh. It's really a special, spiritual place. Because anyone, all persons from around the world who are interested in Christian meditation, Christian mysticism, they go and they study at this university there. So, uh, it's a very, very wonderful place. So my pronounce to you. So don't forget. Uh, do or oh, do you have my card? Uh, no. Let me give you I my card. I wrote his name and his email. Uh -huh. Okay, you send it to me. Right? Yes. Here, please. Yeah, it's for you.